Hey everyone, Dan Keeler here, founder of Frontier Markets News, bringing you more fascinating insights about the trends and stories unfolding beyond the glare of the global media. So this episode connects all the way back to my first few months at the Wall Street Journal. At that time, I was invited to join a lunch with senior editors and the head of Nigeria's United Bank for Africa, Tony Elumelu. The conversation was wide-ranging and fascinating, but the thing that really caught my attention was Tony's plan to set up a program to support entrepreneurs across Africa. To do that, he was pledging $100 million over 10 years, both to create a training and support program for budding business owners and to offer direct grants to thousands of entrepreneurs who successfully completed the program. I've kept track of the remarkable progress that Tony and his foundation have made over the years as the entrepreneurship program has expanded to a scale beyond perhaps what even Tony himself hoped it would reach. And in this podcast, I'll be talking with Samachi Chris Asaluka, who is taking over as the CEO of the Tony Elomelu Foundation after spending many years working there. We got a chance to catch up with her before she jumps into the breach to hear about the work the foundation has been doing, her vision for the future, and a few thoughts on how other organizations can help empower Africans to build their own futures without handouts and aid programs. Samachi, thank you so much for joining us. It's a real pleasure to be talking to you. I know. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for the platform, for your emails, for the invitation. I mean, we're, we're, we're thrilled. Well, uh, I'm thrilled too. So, um, so, so I'd love to talk to you about the role that the foundation is playing in helping tackle some of Africa's thorniest problems, such as migration, inequality, climate change, violent extremism. What do you see as the role that the foundation plays in that, and how can it develop from here? Yes, yes. No, thank you so much, Dan. And I think that the, the, these issues that you pinpointed are very relevant. Um, globally, not just in Africa, globally, yeah, sure. um, but in the African context, I think that the work that we do is primarily to create economic hope and economic opportunity here in Africa. You know, because the reality is for a young man, young woman to risk their lives, um, you know, escaping their economic realities through very dangerous situations and very dangerous means. Um, nobody wants to have to make that choice. Nobody wants to leave their families behind, leave the entire life that they've known to seek economic opportunity elsewhere. And so I think that the work that we do in a nutshell is creating that opportunity here in Africa so that our young men and women don't have to lose their lives all trying to transit out of the lives that they've known, but we're creating prosperity, creating the jobs, you know, alleviating the poverty that a lot of these young men and women um, are facing on the continent. So tell us a bit about how the foundation came about in the first place. So in 2010, Mr. Tony Elumelu, who is our founder, um, was serving as the CEO of the United Bank for Africa, one of Africa's largest financial institutions, even till date. Um, And he began to think about the next chapter. He began to think about what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. Um, And then he decided to focus really on a philanthropy that empowers young business owners. You know, in 2010, when you mentioned philanthropy, very often charity comes into the conversation and it's all about handouts and aid, you know, same old development model speak, right? But he wanted to do something different. He wanted to prioritize and center African entrepreneurs in a way that nobody else was thinking about back then in 2010. And the reason was simple because he was an entrepreneur himself um, and he had gone through starting a business, sustaining a business, scaling a business on the African continent. And I think better than most, he realized the challenges that were inherent in building a business on the continent, especially as a young age. And so what he essentially was trying to do with the foundation is to recreate or rather create more Tony Elumelu's (laughs) Um, And how does the foundation go about creating more Tony Elumelu's? First, we identified these entrepreneurs with transformative business ideas or those already in business, but businesses less than five years old. First, we identify you from across the entire continent and you apply on our platform for a, a chance at being on our entrepreneurship program. Last year, we received over 400,000 applications from entrepreneurs 
to join our entrepreneurship program. Now, why are so many people applying in their thousands? First, because they go through an extensive, rigorous business management training. And when I say business management training, you know, oftentimes um, training in business isn't really contextualized for the African context, right? It really isn't as nuanced. And so you receive training that really is best fits, more applicable to other parts of the world. But our business management training is done for Africans in the African context to start African businesses. It's rigorous, it's hands-on, and we don't leave you alone. What does that mean in reality, that you don't leave people alone when they're on your program? So you have a coach or a mentor appointed by the foundation to each entrepreneur who's going to hold your hand as you go through this training. So this training is is grueling, it's tasking, it's demanding, um, and you need the counsel and the wisdom of someone who's won those shoes before. So each um, entrepreneur is matched with a mentor who's been in that business sector, who understands the fundamentals of running a business in Africa in that sector and is able to guide you as you navigate your way through this rigorous, rigorous, I can't say that enough, business management training. At the end of the business management training, we then shortlist entrepreneurs who go on to the next round. So last year, we had 400,000 entrepreneurs apply. 200,000 were shortlisted for this business management training. And at the end of the training, we shortlisted 90,000 to go through the next stage. The next stage is what we call the business plan stage. Now, many entrepreneurs, not just in Africa, Africa again, but across the world, you know, have a fancy idea in their head but really haven't sat down to understand how it's going to play out in the real sense of the word, right? How do you take that idea to the market? And how do you transform it from an idea into a business? That's not just a business, but a profitable business that's in it for the long term. So each of our entrepreneurs who's been shortlisted to the business plan stage, they get matched with one of our consultants who helps them go through that business plan and edit it and change it and improve it and rework it and tweak it until we feel you have the best business plan for that idea you're trying to build. So how many of the entrepreneurs make it through that stage and on to the next stage? We further shortlist about 50,000 who go on to the next stage. These 50,000 entrepreneurs now have a ready business plan in hand that they're ready to execute in the African market, right? This 50,000 entrepreneurs, to get to the next stage, they need to go through what we call the tier pitching contest. Now, many times you can write a, bus- a good business plan, but we really need to hear from you to make sure you have the passion and the drive and the commitment to start a business and to sustain that business. So all of our entrepreneurs in their different countries need to take that business plan and pitch to a panel of judges and tell us why they deserve to be a finalist on the Tony Elmeli Foundation Entrepreneurship Program. At the end of this pitching stage, entrepreneurs who have been deemed the best of the very best receive the seed capital of $5,000 from the Tony Elmeli Foundation and are now inducted into the Tony Elmeli Foundation Entrepreneurship Program class for that year. And, and how many is that typically? Last year, exactly. Last year, we were able to fund 5,000 entrepreneurs. So we started off with 400,000. For the long run, these entrepreneurs are now Tony Elementary Foundation entrepreneurs. But you mentioned earlier that you don't leave them alone. So what happens then? They are now inducted into their local alumni chapters. So at the foundation, because our work is across all 54 African countries, we have alumni chapters by country. So we have a Ghanaian alumni chapter, uh, a Kenyan alumni chapter, an Egypt alumni chapter, and it goes on and on. So once you become a Tony and Melu Foundation entrepreneur, you're inducted into the alumni chapter. And, and what happens in that alumni chapter is that you get access to further opportunities. So our support doesn't just end with the mentorship, training, coaching, funding we've given you. We also give you a lifetime of access, right? 
access to political leaders to help shape the operating environment in which you operate in. So we know that entrepreneurs don't exist in isolation. So while they need mentorship and training and coaching and funding, if I have all of that, but the business terrain is uninviting and inoperable, then my business is never going to thrive. And so we need that engagement to the public sector to give them the insights and give them the information they need to put in place policies that help entrepreneurs. So lots of governments already have strategies for helping startups to develop. Do you work with them too? Do you partner with governments to help craft their startup and ecosystem development efforts? So our role at the foundation as well is to bridge that gap and to bring entrepreneurs and policymakers to the same table. So the entrepreneurs give you direct feedback on what's missing, what gaps exist, what challenges need to be addressed, and the policymakers can take those insights and quickly implement on it. And so entrepreneurs are having direct say and contributing directly um, in terms of the policy and, and, the, and the regulations that guide um, their businesses. So this is one, this is one thing um, that we focus on with our alumni chapters, as well as further access to um, funding opportunities. So with our partners, and the European Union is one of our partners, we're able to give our entrepreneurs further grants, further equity, further loan, you know, to scale their businesses. So this is in addition to the $5,000 they get through your program, right? We, we don't for one second believe that $5,000 is enough to build the business of your dreams, right? But we think that it's enough to get your foot in the door, get your product to the market, hire a new office space or hire additional talent to prove your concept. So we know that $5,000 is enough to get you started. And that's what we want to do in the first instance. But when we see that you've started and you're beginning to thrive, we're offering even more support. And, and how much additional support are we talking here? So last year with the EU, we're able to give 100 of our women alumni who are you know, the most high-flying success stories additional grants of 50,000 euros each. Now, with that grant, they're doing even more. We have an example of one of our entrepreneurs. You know, We call her Princess. And she wants to create the Starbucks for Africa, right? And with the additional grants that we received from, she received from the EU, she's been able to localize her business chain. So she, she currently does coffee um, and chocolate bars, ETC. But usually she would import the, the cocoa she was using, right, um, in her value chain. But now with the additional grant, she's now gone to parts of northern Nigeria and empowered women to become local cocoa producers. So she's getting her cocoa directly from those women in northern Nigeria and using it to, to, to create her coffee, her chocolate, etc. But without that grant from the foundation and the EU, her business would not have grown to the level where she's empowering other local women, right? And, and, I, and I think that's one of the most amazing thing, things about what we do is that it has such a great multiplier effect. You know, you empower one entrepreneur, but that entrepreneur goes in turn and empowers entire communities. Can you give us an idea of how many people have been affected by this? How many people have been empowered in this way? Um, PwC did a report on our, on our program in 2021, and they saw that only a few thousand entrepreneurs that we've worked with and supported have created 400,000 direct and indirect jobs across the continent. So when they did this um, report, report we, we hadn't funded 18,000 entrepreneurs yet. I think we had funded about 12,000 entrepreneurs at the time. But these entrepreneurs had already created 400,000 direct and indirect jobs. Now they're going to do another study this year. We expect that figure to be well over a million. So you see how just a few thousand African entrepreneurs and creating close to a million jobs across the continent. It's amazing to see this vision coming to life. I think I met Tony around the time that this was launching. I think I met him about 10 years ago. And just remember when he told me about the his plan. And I think at the time he said he had $100 million that he was going to be using over 10 yes, years. Yes, yes. And mm -hmm. it feels like you've mm -hmm. probably gone through that $100 million and more. Um, it looks like we're going to run yeah. for more than 10 years. Yeah. Um, but just the vision that he had to um, to empower people, as you say, and it really is empowerment to empower people, entrepreneurs, men, women, yes. um, 
in Africa to to create their own future was just so powerful and it was so different from what everybody mm-hmm. else was doing. So having having witnessed that and just hearing that story, it's phenomenal the the progress that's been made. And I've you know I've seen it, I've been watching the developments over the past few years. You're just taking over. Congratulations, by the way. You're just taking over as CEO of the foundation, I think at the beginning of next month, um, in March. Yes. March 1st. Mm-hmm. Um, what's your, you're bringing sort of new energy. You've been at the foundation for a long time. You know it yes. from top to bottom. What's your hope that you'll bring to this in, in this new role? It is really to create more impact at scale. So then, you know, we have 400,000 plus young people vying for a spot on our program and we're only able to fund about 5,000 a year. Are we creating hope or are we dashing hope? Wow, yeah. We started off trying to create economic opportunity, economic hope. Are we creating that or are we dashing that? And I think that's a question that I have to wrestle with every day. Do you have an idea how you can scale that? Because that looks like a very tricky job. That, that's why we're launching, exactly. And that's why we're launching a coalition for African entrepreneurship. We're now calling on like-minded governments, like-minded development agencies, like-minded philanthropy, like-minded private sector to come on board and join us in this work of tremendous impact. So how do you plan to do that in practical terms? So we're opening up our model. We're opening up our framework. We want more Tony L. Melu foundations on board so that we can reach more entrepreneurs. Because African entrepreneurs have shown us that there's a demand. There's an overwhelming amount of demand. They don't want to be job seekers anymore. They want to be job creators. And to empower them to be job creators, we need more hands on deck. That's why we're building this coalition. And that's what keeps me up at night. That is my big plan. I can imagine that that gets your heart racing when you think about that. Just the phenomenal <laughs> potential <laughs> of that. Just thinking, you know, we, we talked very early on about um, the kind of people who are being supported through this program. And that, you know, one of the key aims is to provide people an opportunity to, to make a living for themselves Right where they are, rather than having to, as you say, take that dangerous journey across the Mediterranean or wherever. Um, Do you have any specific examples of people who've come through the program who had been considering or thinking that they would be migrating and instead they were able to to stay where they were and create economic opportunity? Yes, yes, yes. No, Dan, before I answer this question, I I want to reveal something to you. So, you know, when people think of the average migrant who's trying to cross the Mediterranean, you know, for greener pastures elsewhere. You think of someone who lacks basic education, someone who probably has no job, um, probably someone who's very much struggling. But the research shows actually that people who are trying to cross the Mediterranean and leave have some degree of study. You know, they've been through high school some university even. So these are people who with targeted support would not be considering this trip. So we have entrepreneurs in their thousands who have come to us and told us, before the Tony L. Melly Foundation, I didn't think Africa was for me. I was ready to risk it all. I was ready to make that journey. But because these these young men and women are already educated, are already trained, but really just needing that support, that someone to believe in them, someone to to lend that helping hand, someone to give them that luck, someone to give them that chance. Nobody else was doing that. They were marginalized, ignored. You know, they, 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 they were all alone. And so they've come to us and they told us, you know, I'm starting this business in Africa and I'm staying in Africa because a, a, an organization like the Tony and Millie Foundation exists. Without you, I would not be here. That's amazing. That's, that's powerful. And that's why we're doing the work that we're doing because we're showing, we're showing the world that young Africans want to transform Africa. They want to stay in Africa, but they need hope in Africa. They need opportunity in Africa. And so what this coalition is doing is calling like-minded organizations, be it in the private or public sectors, 
to come together so that we create more hope in Africa. These entrepreneurs want to stay here, but they can't stay here if they're not meaningfully engaged enough. And so that's that, that, that's, that, that's our job at the foundation. And we need more people to support us. In well, this and the way. positive um, consequences or ramifications of that are so immense. I just, I think it was this week that a report came out from the United Nations about the the direct link between um, work opportunities, employment opportunities, and the reduction in violent extremism. It, it's just yes, such a clear yes. link. And if you're creating, if you've already yes. created four hundred thousand employment opportunities. That's an awful lot of people yes. that have been able to choose to yes. take that path rather than some other path that might be more destructive. Exactly. No, Dan, you know, I think that insecurity is complex. But if we, you know, study closely and dig a little deeper, we see that the root cause of insecurity is poverty. Yeah. If we have a prosperous e- economy, opportunities abound, we will not have insecurity. We will not have yeah. conflict. And so at the foundation, we're dealing with that root cause. That root cause is poverty, a lack of economic yeah. hope. Yeah, and I mean, we've seen this you know, far beyond Africa. Um, when I was growing up in the UK, we had problems with terrorism in Northern Ireland or springing from Northern Ireland. Exactly. And it, it, predominantly, it was people that just had no hope. It was that hopelessness. And we've seen yes. that in so many places around the world. And the idea that you're able to, you're doing something about that at the very root, at the very core of it. And that's what I think is so exciting about this. Um, if, do you have any specific examples of a, of a business that's been created by somebody who said otherwise they would have fled and possibly, you know, taken a risky journey across the Mediterranean? No, Dan, there's so many of them, but I'll just, I'll just try to share one story. So one of my fave entrepreneurs on our program because of the work she's doing in supporting other women is in Kemp Okocha. She's in um, the financial sector and she, she started this microfinance company um, and she lends to very rural, um, remote women who are scattered across Nigeria who will not get funding from banks or, um, you know, any other organized financial institution. Um, because of their, you know, credit worthiness. So in Kemokocha, she grew up in a household where I think she lost her dad at an early age and her mom really hadn't had, you know, didn't go through much schooling um, and, and had very little means to, to, to um, you know, cater for herself and her, and her family. And Inkem grew up just, you know, committing to herself that she was going to have a different life than her mom did. And she was going to make sure that other women in her community, um, you know, had a different life than her mom, her mom did. And so Inkem started um, this idea of this microfinance organization and lending to women. But at the time, she didn't have any support. So Inkem as well was one of those young African women with no economic hope, right? She knew she had a big idea. She had big dreams. But really, there was no support to help her implement those dreams until she stumbled on our application in 2015. So Inkem applied for our Tony and Melu Foundation Entrepreneurship Program, and she went through our training, our mentorship coaching, um, and she received the seed capital of $5,000. With that $5,000, Inkem launched her business. And what Inkem found out, and it really, it, it really goes against the narrative out there, is these women would pay back the loans in record time. And so they were more reliable than the average um, 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 person who was able to access more credit from banks. So there was was a a, a narrative that these women, if you lend to them, they're going to run away with that money. But it can prove that wrong. How women came back record time, repaid the loans, and qualified for larger loans. These women with the loans were able to expand their small trading businesses, send their children to better schools, access better quality health care, really just raise the welfare and raise the livelihood of their families. And so today, Inkem has lent to about 20,000 Nigerian women across the, across the country. These are women who would be turned away, turned away by traditional lending institutions. 
So, um, just winding us back to when you were talking about wanting to get another one. Yes. Yes. Yes, Dan, we do. But you know what we found with our partners, because we have quite a few already, is they come to us and they tell us, you know, we don't want to duplicate or reinvent the wheel, right? We don't want to come to Africa and have to do it ourselves. We don't, because that way you become a clog in the wheel. We have identified you and your work at the Tony L. Miller Foundation. We like your track record. We like your transparency. We like the governance systems you put in place. And most of all, we like the impact you're creating. So we don't want to do the same thing you do. What we want to do is partner with you to scale the work that you're doing. And we think that that's the best way of support. So not to replicate the same programs, but to identify what works and what's needed and get involved in that way. So with this coalition, where we've put in we've put in place a framework where we'll reach more entrepreneurs with XYZ amount of dollars, but we're not giving you a ceiling or a floor and telling you you must put in XYZ funds into this coalition. You come as you are, as long as you have a direct interest in African entrepreneurs, come as you are with the technical support you can provide, with the expertise you can provide, and the funding you're able to commit, and we will use our model our proven tried tested model as a vehicle to reach additional entrepreneurs. So we don't want to run your own programs. We want you to come on board and scale the good work we're right. already doing. So if you're listening to this podcast and you're getting excited about the idea of, of contributing to this um, and you have $10 million sitting around that you want to put to work empowering African entrepreneurs, do do you just come to you and say, I want to give you the money? Or do you want their expertise? Do you want them to actually create, do, would they create like a program within your operation? Like what, how would that work? So we have partners who don't want to be as involved, who just want to give and be updated on the impact that their funding is creating. So with XYZ funds, you've created XYZ number of jobs in XYZ countries on the continent. That's the extent of the participation, right? But we have other partners who want to do more. We have other partner organizations who want their employees to serve as mentors to these African entrepreneurs that they are funding. So they come on board with their mentorship, with their coaching, and with their platforms. We have partners who have platforms that serve as marketplaces to give these entrepreneurs additional access to new markets, to new partners, to new audience, additional visibility to see. So each partner comes with their own priorities, their own needs, and we're able to accept all of that. So you, you can get as involved as you want to get, but also we don't expect that you get too involved so that you continue to do, I mean, your, your, your day job, right? Your daily activities. But we're able to work with you to tailor make the best approach that serves you and your priorities. Just taking a sort of step back and looking at it with a broader lens at the the challenges that you're trying to address, do you feel like the governments of places like the UK and France and Japan and uh, even sort of China and North America, do you, do you feel like they're doing enough to to help kind of fund or promote um, economic empowerment in Africa? Yeah, yeah. No, Dan, I think this is a very thoughtful question you've asked. Um, some of our partners include development agencies, you know, like we've discussed around the world, um, USADF, we also partner with the EU, we also partner with the French Development Agency, and it goes on and on. But I think, as you said, there's that need for more foreign governments to center and prioritize African SMEs. Everyone knows it's good to support SMEs. But I think there needs to be more targeted commitment towards centering development around SMEs. And that's why Mr. Lumelu and his delegation, you know, we were in the U.S. three times last year, first in April and then in September and then in December, because he's championing this new, you know, reframing of Africa's relationship with the West. So it's no longer a continent of aid, of charity, of handouts. It's a continent of economic opportunities. 
is a continent of transformation. But the only way we're going to get to that point of transformation is if we collectively, these governments begin to collectively center and prioritize African entrepreneurs so that our development policy, our foreign agenda, our foreign policy is around how to best support African entrepreneurs. Because, you know, with supporting them, you're able to meet other development aspirations. So you want to invest in healthcare. But if you support the right health entrepreneurs on the continent, they will do all the transformation. They're on ground. They understand the context better than anyone else. They understand the local supply and value chains. They understand where the challenges are. So instead of development policies that are set abroad, bring these entrepreneurs in, invest in their businesses. They will meet all the development targets. Right. Yeah, it's so so true. You're harnessing the energy of people who are absolutely committed already. And they're not going to go away. Exactly, because they're there anyway. Exactly. You know, instead, and, and just very quickly, you know, instead of coming to communities and giving them medicine and 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 rice and food stuff, and I know there's a role for that, right? In terms of emergency situations, there's need for that type of handouts. But that shouldn't be the, that shouldn't be the bulk of our development model, right? Instead of giving families medicine and 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 food stuff, why not empower them to start businesses? That way they earn an income and they're able to purchase these things for themselves by themselves. Right. Do, do you get the impression that, um, that that message is getting through, though? Because I um, perhaps it's just because of what I've been focusing on as a journalist in the past couple of years. But, you know, particularly in the, in the kind of impact side and the development finance side, it does seem like there's an understanding of the importance of, of creating the environment where economic opportunity kind of grows organically rather than airdropping money in or support or whatever, which can come and go. You're in a prime position to say yes or no that you're seeing that because you're obviously interacting with people at that. The yes, the government yes. And so on. What, what do you think? Yes. Is there a change? I think it's changing, Dan, but I, think, I don't think it's changing quick enough. I don't think it's changing as rapidly enough as it needs to. You know, Africa is the youngest continent. Nigeria alone has about 200 million people. 70% of those people are under 30 years of age. So the continent is growing at such an incredibly fast pace that the response from development actors isn't catching up with yet. And so there's a change, as you said, but it cannot be incremental. We're not growing at, at an incremental rate. So that incremental what's lacking might be just that the people with the money who are crafting these strategies aren't thinking of the recipients of the investment as partners in this as a kind of multiplier effect and that's where you know i think what you're doing is different because you see that multiplier effect exactly exactly you know dan i think you nailed it they aren't seeing them as partners but as beneficiaries yeah. and that that would change everything if they think of it as investing in exactly. people rather than just providing support. Exactly. 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 Dan, I think you're spot on. And and, and, and that's what and that's the work we're doing. We're championing, we're advocating. And the good news is that we have all this impact behind us. So we can show you as evidence, as proof that what we're doing is working, but we need to do more at a faster yeah. pace. There's no more time. There's no there's no time. It left. sounds like you're you're working pretty hard to do more at a faster pace. We have to, Dan. We have to. We have to. You know, there are too many hopes that I'm currently dashing by selecting 5,000 out of only 400,000 that I have to be up every night thinking of new ways to bring more partners on board to scale this impact. Well, I, I hope that you find those solutions because what you're doing so far is is amazing. And to see the results of that, it's been really heartening. And... Um, I can't wait to see what you do in your role as CEO of the foundation. Really looking forward to that. Thank you so much. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, It's been fascinating. I have to say about four or five times I got very serious chills just listening to you talking about the stories of the people that you're working with. Thank you, Dan. And thank you. Thank you for also being an ally. And not just now. You've been an ally for many years and believing in the work that we're doing 
and giving your platform to these entrepreneurs and hearing that, you know, for others who listen to your podcast to hear their stories. So thank you for the work that you've done and the commitment you've been showing over the years to supporting young African entrepreneurs. So thank you, Dan, and well done. <laughs> Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of the Frontier Markets News Podcast. We were joined by Somachi Chris Asaluka, who is the new CEO of the Tony Elomelu Foundation. As always, you can get the latest summary That's of news the capital from alone. Frontier, you cannot have. At Frontier Markets. A lot will be done to support African entrepreneurs. You can also sign up there for our weekly the newsletter, which will arrive in your inbox every Saturday. And that's provide why you with we have come here to encourage you and take our continent The music on this podcast is What's Tony the Angle by Shane Ivers from, from really SilvermanSound.com. Next 10 years, our goal is... And if you've enjoyed this podcast and want us to be please share it with your friends, your colleagues people wandering down the street, your followers on social media. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it. Send me an email at dan at frontiermarkets.co. And that's a wrap. Until next time. <laughs>